So hello everyone and welcome. Welcome to Behavior Change for Manufacturing, Talent and Business Sustainability. This is our fourth webinar in a series where we look at the role of behavior change interventions across the industry with uh, a particular focus on all things net zero and sustainability. Uh, we've done all of these events in collaboration with ESRC, the Economic and Social Research Council, uh, to bring actionable social science insights to business challenges. And today, uh, you'll get to hear about some exciting case studies on the type of behavior change required uh, to make manufacturing sustainable um, and the future of manufacturing work as well. Um, and some of the changes that companies can make today to make sure they uh, recruit and retain uh, best talent. My name is Alexandra Jugurano. I'm from Innovate UK KTN. And in my day to day, I explore the role of social sciences in business innovation. That's me on the far right there. Uh, and we also have um, Jill McBride, uh, co director of, of Interact, um, and Peter Ball, uh, professor at the School of Business and Society at the University of York. Um, and I'm uh, truly excited to welcome Lukam, uh, Lukman Hakim, uh, who will be the chair for today's uh, session. Uh, for context, KTN is a business connector organization. Uh, at KTN, we connect people for positive change in society, from our diverse business communities to uh, the academics we work with, to investors and funders. Um, and our strategic priorities cover themes like net zero, place, uh, DNI, adoption and diffusion. And at the core of all that is the ambition to deliver societal and environmental impact while continuing the work that we do for uh, economic benefits. Um, today for this webinar, uh, we partner with Made Smarter Innovation to bring you this session. Uh, and as I just mentioned, we have some amazing speakers um, and uh, chaired by Lukman, my colleague. Before passing in uh, on to him for the rest of the session, just a few housekeeping rules from me. Uh, please be aware that your audio is muted and your video is turned off for the duration of the session. Uh, you can use the chat to report any technical issues you have uh, to Chris Ford. Uh, he's the facilitator for this webinar. You can find his name um, in the chat function. Uh, but please use the Q&A function to submit any of your questions for the speakers. We will collate your uh, questions and answer as many as we have time for in the dedicated Q&A uh, part at the end of the webinar. And as you can see, the session is being recorded um, and we will send a recording and any kind of additional event materials uh, to you uh, in, in due course after this finishes. Now that's all for me. Uh, thank you so much for being here. I hope you enjoy the session and I'll just pass over to Lukman. Thank you, Alex, for the honor. So, like explained by Alex, my name is Lukman, and I'm from the Industrial Technologies and Manufacturing team at Innovate UK KTN. So, first and foremost, uh, let me introduce to you what KTN do. So, on your left, we have Innovate UK, which is the UK's innovation agency, uh, which provides most of the public fundings in the country and it's a non-departmental public body operating at arm's length from the government as part of the UK research and innovation ecosystem. Whereas in the middle, we have KTN that provides the one to many matchmaking services connecting with the right project collaborators and also uh, leading you to the right funding opportunities. Whereas our colleagues at Innovate UK Edge can provide a one-to-one -one personal support to grow your business. So at Innovate UK KTN, within my team, the Industrial Technologies and Manufacturing, we have connections within the industry, academia, and any organization in between those two spectrums. Subject areas that we cover specifically would include electronics, manufacturing, photonics, sensors, and computing. But we know that the importance of working with other sectors to extend your ideas and your applications, so that's why Within Innovate UK KTN, we have a lot of teams that operate uh, in close uh, contacts with us. At this point, you might be asking how extensive is our network? We have 
connections with many organizations and individual innovators across the UK and also globally. And we also have active relationships with every single university in the UK. And amongst the many programs that we have, we would endeavor to connect you with the right community, or in other words, we call it as innovation networks. So in the industrial technologies and manufacturing team, we have the Made Smarter Innovation Network, for example. Once you are part of this network, or in fact, any network, you will get the latest news, get relevant event invitations, and get all of the updates related to that sector. And Knowledge Transfer Partnership Initiative is another initiative by KTN. We connect you uh, between industry and uh, universities so that you can work in partnership to achieve and solve any of your technical problems. From time to time, Made Smarter Innovation also publishes well-researched insights and reports that outlines all of the challenges and potentials that you can learn from your sector. So uh, as I introduced before, Made Smarter Innovation is the UK's government initiative worth 147 million to accelerate digital technology adoption within the traditional manufacturing industry. So we have a lot of sub programs within our Made Smarter Innovation project. Let's say if you are really early in your innovation journey and still at the prototyping stage, you can work with our research centers to benefit from their facilities and expertise. And we also provide collaborative R&D funding so that industry and academia can work together. And we also have innovation hubs to help you commercialize and test your ideas even further. And if you are ready, you can go through our digital accelerator program so that you can create products that can be sold locally, nationally, and also globally. So the best part is if you are part of this Made Smarter Innovation Network, which is the black track here, you, will, you can get access to all of these sub-programs uh, in one go. And in specific, we have five research centers, one network, and two innovation hubs that can help us achieve those bold goals. And we are really pleased today because we have Jill from the Interact Network who will be our first speaker. So Jill, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction, both of you. Um, and good morning, everybody. It's fantastic to see so many people joining um, this webinar today. Um, as they've said, my name is Jill McBride. I'm a professor of innovation and operations management. I'm based at Strathclyde University in Glasgow, um, but I'm also co-director of Interact. And my other co-director, some of you might know, Jan Godsell, who's based down at Loughborough. Um, and together we are funded um, by the ESRC, the Economic Social Research Council. And what we aim to do is try and bring the human aspect of digital change in manufacturing. So really we're we are looking more at the people side than the technology side. Now, my own research throughout my career um, has always been about helping organizations to change, to improve, to become more competitive. So I started out as a kind of operations management, but in changing environments, and that kind of led me into the kind of innovation space. But a lot of what I do is based around manufacturing. So today, um, I really just wanted to set the scene um, uh, and talk a little bit about um, change in manufacturing, why we might do it and how we might do it. Now, we could talk for days on this topic, but I've kind of got 10, 10, 10 to 15 minutes maximum. So I'm going to share some thoughts, tell some stories, um, but happy to pick up the conversation either through the Q&A or um, at a later date. And the other thing I want to do is I want to introduce you to the Interact Network, because some of you might find some of the events that we run or some of the research we do um, interesting and useful. So that's what I, I'm going to talk about today. And the first half is the kind of why change and how do we change? 
And I'm going to first of all talk about four reasons why we might have to change in manufacturing. Now, there's lots more, but I'm only going to focus on, on four initially. Um, and that is one of the, the problems we have at the moment in manufacturing is about getting the right people in manufacturing jobs, attracting and retaining talent. talent. The other thing I'm going to talk about is um, changing in technology. And because I work as part of Made Smarter, um, there's lots of digital technology, industrial technologies in there. I'm going to talk about general competitiveness and um, why we need to change to become more competitive. And that might be about becoming more efficient, might be about quality issues. It might be becoming more effective, for example, or encouraging innovation in your business. And finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about sustainability, but then I'm going to hand over to Peter Ball, who will focus more about behaviour change um, for sustainability. Now, talking about the, the how we can change. Now, I'm not going to give a big academic lecture today. Um, instead, I'm going to tell you a few stories. So when we start looking at my, my next slides, I've got logos. And really, that's just to remind you to tell remind me uh, to tell you some stories when I've been involved in behaviour change with organisations and some of the things we've learned. But if anybody's interested in the ac academic side, I can point you to lots of references. Like so many areas, you know, there's the four R's of behaviour change, there's the four E's, there's the seven principles, lots of things going on. But for me, when I'm looking at change, I always ask questions about three big areas. And they are motivation. How do we make sure people have the, the reason and the motivation to change? Do they have the ability and capability? So do they have the skills? Do they have the tools and so on? And the third area I look at is, are we creating the right environment for change to happen. So that's three themes that I'll, I'll, I'll focus on. Now, some of the companies I'll talk about are KTP companies. Some of the companies I'll talk about I've met either through consultancy or events or perhaps um, research projects. So again, happy to talk about these more in the Q&A. But let's start with our, why do we need to change? And um, my first slide here, um, when I'm out talking to manufacturers, as I do a lot, the biggest challenge that I've been hearing in the last couple of years is about people. We've not got enough people to fill the roles. We've got vacancies. We're struggling to attract people and keep people. Um, now, Make UK, the employers organisation, is also very worried about this. And I've put on this slide a couple of um, figures and quotes coming from Make UK. And there's a bigger issue about what do we do as a nation about attracting people to manufacturing. But that's not for today's conversation. Um, I'll come back to that later. But for today's conversation, I'm looking at what do manufacturers themselves do to try and address this issue? And what behaviour changes do we need to see? And again, I've put a couple of um, little uh, logos and things down to remind me. And one of the things I've found companies are starting to do when they can't, where they're finding it difficult to attract people, is they set about trying to make themselves an attractive employer. And that very often means doing things like introducing more flexibility um, for workers, empowering workers, and moving away from that kind of command and control, um, typical, very traditional way of managing into something that's much more empowering for their workforce. Um, and one example of that is Alba. And Alba is a company I'm working with at the moment. Um, it's actually a KTP um, a project I'm working on. And it's an interesting example. Now, like many others out there, they're getting frustrated about how difficult it is to recruit talent and keep talent. But being a progressive company, they have set out to say, we want to make this the best place to work um, for engineers. We want to attract, attract the best talent. And they're on a journey with um, people from Strathclyde um, to make changes using KTP um, as, as, a, as a mechanism. A couple of interesting things. I'm going to talk about my motivation, ability, ability and environment. And the first thing I'm going to talk about is motivation. And something they recognised was there was an interest in going to a four-day week. Now, I would often say when you're looking at motivation, if you can create something that's a collective goal, then that's really powerful. Something that people can work to, towards together. Um, and what they discovered was when they started talking about the possibility of a four-day week, it was very, very popular. So people want to see this happen. And when they talk about four-day week, 
what they're talking about is keeping the same salary, but working less um, hours. So um, taking a day out of the working week. So that's quite a powerful motivator that's driving change at the moment, behaviour change. If we look at the ability, um, an interesting one here, because to get to that four day week, they're going to have to become more efficient in what they do. So they're now exploring ways of how do we use more digital technologies, for example, to help speed up some of our, our tasks and make ourselves more efficient. And because they've got that goal of the four day week uh, as, a, as a kind of this is what we want to achieve, it's helping with motivating and driving change in behaviour. So they're looking to bring in more efficiency. So talking about new technologies, they're talking about training and so on. Um, so what is happening there is, is driving additional changes in behaviour around technology. And if we look at the environment, um, when, we're, when we talk about this kind of change, it's going to mean behaviour change for people in the organisation and managers in particular. They have to let go of these old ways of working and that kind of command and control and presenteeism and all these um, issues and empowering workers. Um, and it means opening up new conversations. So that's an interesting one, I think, that uh, is a story that is playing out just now. Another logo I've got in here is, is Flexibility Works. And this is a, a, an organisation that Interact are part, partnering with. And we're actually going to hold an event in June. So watch out for stuff on social media coming from myself and Interact in the next few days once we agree a, a venue and a, and a date for that. But it's looking like the first week in June. Um, where Flexibility Works is a company who's looking at good practice in flexible working and manufacturing. And Interact are, are using them to help us put, to get, to put together a discovery day so that companies like uh, the ones that are on this call can come along and hear how some of the companies like Alba are making these transitions. Another um, image that I've put up there is I was part of a Equalities and Wellbeing um, working group for the Scottish Government recently. And that's an interesting one because um, if we want to attract more talent, we're going to have to attract from a bigger pool. And it's not that we're being, um, I don't think it is that we're being particularly biased in the way that we recruit people, but we're not selling manufacturing to as wide an audience as we could. Um, and that's something that, again, um, Interact is very interested in. Happy to chat further about that. But for just now, let's move on to another reason we might need to change in manufacturing. We might need to change because there are new technologies um, that we can utilise that will help us be more efficient, that will save us money, that might make us faster, that might open up new markets. Um, and because I'm involved with, with the Made Smarter Innovation team, um, this is where I spend a lot of time in my Interact um, role. So again, a couple of um, uh, logos I've put down there just to remind me of, of some stories. Now, WB Alloys is actually another KTP project I'm working on just now. And this is a company that supply um, welding engineers, they supply welding equipment um, and supplies for welding. But they recognised, they saw that there was a, a kind of change in the market and they, they wanted to develop um, smart welding technology that could basically monitor, um, a, monitor welding and increase productivity. So this is something that they're doing just now. Um, and going back to that kind of motivation, they're seeing what's happening in the market. And one of the things that they're doing with employees is they're taking them and showing them good practice and making them see how things are changing. In terms of ability, they're using KTP as a mechanism to bring in new talent, both in terms of the kind of digital technology, but also the commercial support um, in, in the shape of myself and some colleagues in helping them take this to market and they're creating a, a, the right environment um, to encourage innovation. Another company that uh, I've worked with in the past, a company called Booth Welsh, um, they're, they're a company who have done a lot to introduce new technology into manufacturing, but very much bottom up. And again, what they've done is they've created the right environment um, where the flattened management structures, they use the idea of collabs where they invite people from different areas of the business, not necessarily technical, from all areas of the company, and they bring them together in these co-lab spaces and give them a challenge to say, how do we do this differently? Or how do we use this technology? And that's an interesting one because it really is um, creating a wave that's coming from the employees 
and they're the ones that are really driving the change. Although I have to say, and their, their management team also very much um, leading by example and rewarding and celebrating success, which I think is, is really important um, when you're driving change. Um, a third area would be about um, increasing competitiveness, which crosses all the different boundaries I'm talking about. Um, but it might be about uh, becoming more efficient, about saving money, about um, encouraging innovation, it might be quality. Um, an example I've got here to remind you, I was working with a company, again, it was a KTP project actually, um, not manufacturing this time, but with Scottish Power. And Scottish Power recognised that they had lots of challenges and they had lots of smart people within the organisation. So they wanted to encourage that kind of open innovation, getting the power of the crowd, the crowd in this case being their employees, but not necessarily people who, um, who are innovating part of their day job, but asking them to think differently and um, look at some of the grand challenges. So they actually started using a, a open innovation platform called Hype. Um, and what they did there is they, they put in this platform, and bear in mind in Scottish Power, we're talking about a lot of engineers who aren't in an office, they aren't at desks, they're out in the field working, um, but they could access this via mobile devices and so on. And what they did was they, they, they identified um, champions, basically, to be innovation champions uh, in all areas of the business. And they were people who were perhaps quite influential, perhaps not the, the highest um, paid, perhaps not the highest in terms of ranking, but people they knew could create a buzz around innovation. And they trained people and they had events like, um, you know, pizza uh, afternoons where they, they brought in food and they opened up discussion around innovation and what we could do differently. Um, and that's something where the motivation was very much about showing them where there was potential issues and inviting people to open up and get involved. Um, ability, they had to train people in terms of um, how to analyze situations, how to use the innovation platform. But now they're kind of rolling on this um, activity and lots of people are contributing and it's been rolled out across the or organization. Um, and I think, again, management are celebrating success, communicating in a standard way and, um, and rewarding success. So one other um, slide here about sustainability, and I'm not going to dwell on this one because Peter's going to talk a lot about sustainability. Um, I've got a picture of beer cans there, um, and that's to remind me, I actually worked on a project with Peter Ball at, at, at York, and together we were looking at encouraging um, more sustainable practices within brewing. And that was a, a joyful project because in this case, sustainability was something that everybody could, could see. Again, it was a shared goal, and it was an industry that was very open to sharing good practice. So Peter might touch on that one um, uh, when he picks up. But I want to use my kind of last few minutes to, to introduce Interact. And at the start, uh, Alexandra and Luquan both said, um, I'm part of Interact. And Interact, part of the Made Smarter Innovation family, if you like. Um, but whereas a lot of Made Smarter is about developing industrial technologies and encouraging the diffusion of new technologies within manufacturing. And a lot of that's technological. Where Interact is different is it's much more around the people side, so the softer skills. And what Interact is all about um, is uh, our, our aims are, are down there, that really what we're trying to do is we're trying to bring social and economic scientists into this kind of space because we know that when we introduce new technologies, a lot of the challenges are human rather than technological. So what Interact's about is about connecting with people from psychology, sociology, business, economics, and lots of great insights that we, we've got in these different um, domains. But perhaps people who have never really thought about applying these insights in manufacturing or the use of digital technologies. So that's really what Interact is all about and it's a network um, it's a network and uh, the next slide shows some of the things that we, we look at within internet 
Now, right at the start, we made the decision to hang our work on looking at the future and creating the digital future we want. So again, I've not got time to tell you an awful lot about Interact, but we can pick it up in the questions. But we've got a number of, of um, activities. And the first one is a core research programme where we're really looking at the future and thinking about the future of manufacturing in terms of what is the, does the ecosystem look like? Who are the players? How will we work together? Um, looking at the future of work, and that's a work stream that I lead at Strathclyde, and also looking at the interplay between manufacturing and the economy, and that's led by Vani Asena um, at, uh, at, at uh, Sheffield University. But we've also got money in the pot within Interact to commission work, and to commission work that responds to industry needs. So there's a number of things we do there. We can commission reviews, and um, we've got small projects that could help our companies, and something we've got coming up in, in May, actually, is we're running a sandpit event. And we're, we've got a call out just now for companies who might have challenges and they would like to get good minds, interdisciplinary teams, looking at some of these problems. So if any of you on this call have got something that you've been worrying about and you would like us to help bring a team together to look at that, then please do contact me, put it in the chat or drop me an email later. And the, the final kind of um, a column there is about impact accelerators. So again, we've got money that uh, we support, perhaps research that's been done, but at the moment is languishing in academic journals. How do we turn that into actionable insights that can be used by industry, whether that's an app, whether it's a tool, uh, whether it's a video or something. Um, but we've got money to support activities like that. And we've also got lots of um, events and like the Discovery Day um, that I talked about earlier. So as I say, um, the core research, um, three main topics about ecosystems, my future of work and the future of the economy, but we're short of time, so we can come back to that if anybody's got any questions. And some of the upcoming opportunities within Interact, um, as I say, there's a sandpit event we're going to run over um, uh, three days in May, bringing together um, experts in lots of different areas of social science, from psychology, economics, geography, lots of different things, um, to really address some of the challenges that you have out there. So please, if you've got challenges, let me know and we can perhaps help you. We're also trying to encourage um, the next generation of people telling positive stories about manufacturing and about digital change. So we've got a storytelling academy, trying to get a much more positive view of manufacturing out there. Um, again, something that I've, I've not got time to tell you too much about today, but um, I've just had uh, done a survey of um, UK people of all ages, and we've got 2,100 responses. And we were asking people about their perceptions of manufacturing. Now, fascinating. Um, I need to find the time in the next few weeks to analyze it, but um, you'll, you'll hear lots from me in social media and through the internet platform around the findings of that perceptions of manufacturing survey. But we've also got discovery days, webinars, and so on. Um, and my last slide is really that kind of get involved with Interact. Um, either visit our website, which is this www.interacthub, um, or um, join us on social media. Um, I'm quite active myself on LinkedIn, probably less so myself on Twitter, but the Interact team um, are, are active on, on Twitter. So please do um, engage and get involved. And with that, I'm looking at the clock. My time is up. I'm going to stop. Um, I'd love to talk more with you. So please do put any questions in the Q&A or in the chat. And with that, I'll stop sharing and hand over to my colleague, Peter. Thank you, Jill. I am just going to share my slides and then I will make a link to what Jill has been presenting. So one of the things that was quite striking for me about the way Jill was presenting was at one point she was talking about talent and people and, and also companies. And I want to do the same in saying, well, if you want companies to change their behavior, then you need individuals who have got the talent to be able to support that change and, and vice versa. So I will talk about sustainability. I'll talk about talent. And I'll talk about how um, some of these practices can be shared. And one of my messages to you is 
I'm going to present some quite big ambition. Um, so I, I, I want it to, to, to set out a stall to say the talent that you need has to be ready for today, but also to be able to help with these changes for the future. So that's where I'm going. I've got a couple of thoughts and questions for you to start off with. The reason I put that question up is because, and we can discuss this later, um, for me, on a company board, if there was a sustainability director, it was their responsibility to, to look after sustainability. I think this has been a sea change now, and it's boards see sustainability as their responsibility, and the CEO is heavily engaged in it. So I think there's been a, a big change in a corporate sense. Um, operationally, I think there's always been a change in um, um, going on. But I want to look a little bit into the future. You might not say, you might say this is not far enough. Just some thoughts about where your electricity or your power will come from in a couple of years. Um, I know a company that's busy buying up contracts for its supplies for uh, power in the in the coming decade. Um, it's going to be a bit of a shock for their neighbours when they try and get more power out of the local substation because there might not be any left. So that move to electrification is going to cause some major challenges and you need the people to help you with that change. A couple of other things. Um, do you know what's in your supply chain? And also further lower down, do you know what should be in your supply chain? I, I think it's well known that we should worry about what's in our supply chain. Um, things like child labour, unethical practices, but, but also other things like what's in your carbon set, um, your, your carbon offsets. Are, there, are they really carbon offsets or is, is it a, a clever use of accounting? And what should be in your supply chain in the future? I think I'm imagining a future where people will worry about what they have put in their supply chain rather than what they've taken out. And there's going to be greater responsibility of companies to do things for their supply chain to, to help with regeneration and to help with developing a more inclusive, more um, um, equitable environment. And the other thing is to think about where your products um, might be in, in five years. You, you might not be worrying about it now, but um, you might be worrying about where your materials might be coming from in the future. So there's, there's a connection there. So I wanted to paint this broad picture to, to look at some, some big challenges coming forward and therefore um, what actions can we take or what actions can we afford not to take. Um, the, uh, we've all been using um, lean principles, I hope. Um, it has taken decades to move to, on along the lean journey. Um, we need to move faster on sustainability, but those lean principles can help with things like um, removing waste that includes energy. Um, and one of the things I want to think about is where your impact is as a company on the, on the, the sustainability net zero um, focus, because my guess is it won't be in your company. It will be in the supply chain somewhere. And then I'll give you some examples. This will be a pattern of what I present. I'll give you some examples in a minute. But this idea of relentless or obsessive efficiency is going to get you a long way. And I'll, I'll give you some examples of this. But I'll also exert some caution and say it's going to get you a long way and it's a good start, but it's not going to get you the whole journey. We, we need to be more radical in some of the things that, that we do. And some examples for you. Um, Airbus have signs on some of their machines to say um, if this machine is running and it's not producing, it has to be turned off. So people are starting to identify ways of not just switching off the light bulbs, but switching off production. Um, for those, it's probably a bit early in the day to be talking about beer, and um, I'll mention beer again later on, um, projects I've worked with Jill on. Um, most of the beer carbon footprint is in the supply chain. It's on the supply side. It's at the farming level and um, agriculture, especially fertilizer dominates. So companies are trying to help farmers reduce their reliance on fertilizers. If you're Unilever selling a bottle of shampoo 
most of your um, carbon impact is is everyone listening um it's 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 us spending too much time in the shower so they have to educate their consumers two really interesting examples at least for me um if you haven't come across NSERC 360 in the bottom right do look them up i naively visited their factory thinking they were a glass producer at the end they, they do make glass the sand comes in at one end out of the other is a pallet configured to go to a particular supermarket. And I think that is a really interesting value proposition where you say to your customers, supermarkets, we will configure pallets that you can pick up or even will deliver to you that can go to your distribution depot and instantly be put out to the individual supermarkets. You own the whole supply chain and therefore you can optimize um, what goes on there and the energy and impact that results. And a final um, example, River Simple, you cannot buy this car. I don't think you ever will be able to buy this car, but you will be able to rent it or hire it. Um, you pay by the kilometer, you don't pay for fuel. They take care of absolutely everything and they want to own their car because they want to monitor that car, they want to optimize that car and they want the materials in it. They can't afford to lose control and, it, and if you go and look at their website, they have this systems view. It's a very enlightened company in the way um, the, the way they approach how to move people around. So those are some detailed examples, but how, how do you get the knowledge to do this? I won't spend too long on this um, process, but if you haven't started, then look to the left. And if you have started, then look to the right. But on the left is you need to pilot. Um, if you're starting out, you need to pilot, get, get credibility and confidence and develop more projects, develop practices, and then start to embed those change behaviors and those standardized processes. And you have a leader who leads a small team and, and you develop that. But then as you get better, you, you take those local savings and spread them around company-wide or supply chain-wide. Um, the the local leaders you need to develop. So you, you start to pass on the, the, the talent and the behavior changes to enable more people to take a fundamental process. So you're getting more people involved. And then you need to move on to systematic improvements or systemic improvements. Um, and I think I've given you enough examples already about suppliers and customers. Toyota on lean decades and decades and decades, but on the area of um, energy, sustainability, net zero, I would, I'm would. i estimating about 20 years they've been working on this. Airbus have a European network that look around um, across the company, across Europe, and share practices where people help each other out. And that enables knowledge to develop and ambition to, 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 to be increased. Jill mentioned beer. I'm going to mention it a second time. Um, we, it, what amazed me about the craft brewers is how much they share. Even competitors will share because they are really good at saying, this is my competitive edge. This is what I can share. And they, and they help each other because it's mutually beneficial. Um, Adnams works with Natural England. Unilever work with UNICEF. Those collaborations with NGOs, wider stakeholders are really important for developing um, the, 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 the businesses purpose and operations, but it also means that you need people who can do those things. And, and there's a way of which to acquire those skills by, by talking to other companies. Um, and Transfire is a project that I'm working on. Um, a number of universities and companies involved, we, we want to look at systemic, systematic improvements across the supply chain. So do you don't just improve one foundation industry, one glass plant or ceramics or paper plant, you improve you improve the cluster around it. Give you some measurement. Um, I, you may have come across this. The six capitals is a means of um, reporting. It's also clustered here on this slide according to the pillars of sustainability. And I wanted to focus on the middle bit because that human knowledge, the human capital, the, the knowledge and skills, the IP, but also that social network, whether it's individuals talking to one another or it's 
a network of companies talking together is so, so important. Yorkshire Water, the local enterprise partnership in our area, uh, York and North Yorkshire, um, uses it. Um, industrials such as Beckert use it as well. It's it's just a really interesting way of tying to the to the the, the corporate reporting, but it also um, is a way of looking at how your the networks operate. I've got a few more things to say, and then I'll, I'll then I'll zip it. Um, I wanted to question why big is so important to us. We we make things in big hospitals, big schools, big factories. Um, we're doing a lot of research on small things. So um, one of Jill Sampit's um, type style, it was a different funder, but um, I worked with um, the IntelliDigest on the right-hand side, small fridge type size, fridge on its side type size unit to digest food waste. On the right-hand side, um, local food, uh, local waste. This is brewery waste in York. We're using those concepts. It's Sandpit brought companies and, 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 and academics together to work on a project. That brewery waste can make bio leather and biomaterials that can build things, used to build things, such as the fabric of a container farm in the top right. Um, going back to that purpose of, of what's in your supply chain or what should be in your supply chain, that container, the shipping container top right, is a farm. It's in the center of York. You might think your tourism, lovely buildings and so forth. The food produced in that shipping container doesn't have food miles. It has food meters. The food moves about 10 meters from harvest to, to use in um, food production. So it's, a, it's an entertainment complex. You can go and have food grown in there on your pizza. And finally, in the center, the, the digital sides that um, Jill was talking about, about the future of technology, both hard technology. Top middle picture is a MTC um, shipping container again. It's a factory in a box. And below is AMRC's um, factory of the future, di digital tools to support that type of operation. So we can do things small and, and technology is an enabler. A few more things and then I, I will keep quiet. We have a Fix Our Food project. It's looking at changing the food system to, on the right-hand side, that triangle, a future regenerative food system. So I don't know whether you're aware that farming is currently degenerating our soils. And it's a major concern because people don't measure you know, how much copper is left or how much um, lithium is left or whatever. Alone, people are measuring how much soil is left. So. Horizon one is the dominant horizon, and we want to we want to infiltrate and change that horizon of the dominant way of doing things in the food system. Horizon three in the green is what we envisage the future should be, and horizon two is the transition, how we move from a degenerative to a regenerative food system. And it's it's companies, stakeholders, and academics all working together. Now that. That might seem a bit, oh, that's a bit you know, far-fetched and um, that's a bit intangible, wishful thinking. My final example, and then I will draw to a close, Patagonia, I hope you know of it as a company in um, outdoor clothing that is a, it, it promotes activism. It's got profit over purpose. 1% of its turnover, not profit, but it's not a percentage of profit, it's a percentage of turnover, it goes to environmental non-profit groups. And you might think, oh, that's expensive. It, it's growing faster than, than its competitors. The trouble is, its growth is built on selling stuff, and that impacts the environment badly. You might think I'm heading towards a criticism of this company. I am not. Um, this company is looking at selling, reselling, used clothes so it's actually going to cannibalize its primary sales with with used product and it's also looking at regenerative they want to regenerate they want to put back more than they took so initially they're looking at agriculture so i thought i'd give you that as an example of this is a company that's 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 walking this talk
That's me to close. I hope I've given you a compliment of what Jill was talking about. And we've both been talking about companies and people and the talent to help with the, with the new technologies and new pressures for an ambitious future. Two videos, I'm not going to show you them, but they, they give some of the visions that we've got on urban circularity as well as business model innovation. I've talked for too long. I'm going to shut up. Um, look, man, I think, I think it's back to you. Yeah. Thank you, Peter, and thank you, Jill, for your uh, interesting presentation. So we will now head over to the Q&A session. We have the first question coming from John. He said he met the Parliamentary Undersecretary of State at the Department of, for Business and Trade, Kevin, in person two weeks ago, but he was asking about how do we ensure that support that we give to SMEs uh, are in line with the aims of the B base BEIS Small and Medium Enterprises Action Plan? I think that's possibly more one for the, the, um, the people from Innovate UK <laughs> than, than us academics. Yep, so uh, as Jill mentioned, John, uh, Innovate UK might have the right answer for that question because they are uh, much closer to the government. And another question from John, uh, he's very active here. As resistance to change it seems to be a common theme for digitalization and sustainability project, how do we concentrate on actually improving change, uh, i.e. the skills in being more confident, more capable, and able to actually embrace those changes? I'll, I'll maybe make a start on that one, but I think, I think for me, the, the motivation is, is again really key. Um, I'm a great believer in showing people, um, you know, either showing people what could be done different or showing people the real reason, the evidence why we need to change. So taking people out of their 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 day to day is, is something I do a lot. Um, pairing up with other organizations, taking them to different companies, encouraging them to come to events like this and, and discovery days and other things that, that we do. Um, I think there's a, there's also that kind of ability and skills. I think there's lots of mechanisms where we can um, we can help train people, um, whether that be through uh, things like Interact, whether it be through things like high value manufacturing catapults. I know certainly in Scotland, Enmis does a lot in that kind of space. Um, and I think there's a lot to be done as well in, in schools and universities in a broader um, sense, making sure that people have got these kind of um, the right, not just the right technical skills, but as, as you rightly said, John, that kind of tenacity and ability to react to change. Okay, uh, hope it answers yeah. your question. Or Peter, I, you just a, a quick thing to complement that. I, I emphasize sharing, and I I am constantly surprised how much people are willing to share as long as there's, there's, a, there's a networking opportunity to make those connections. And, and it doesn't have to be within a sector, although I knew, do know that competitors such as breweries, I won't mention some of the other ones, but there's some that could, could be quite surprising where they, they do talk to each other and they do share and they're quite happy to be in the same room as each other, but also maybe sharing across different domains where a bread manufacturer can learn from a, an aerospace manufacturer and vice versa. So I think that that sharing and seeing what other people are doing allows people to go back to their own companies and saying, look, they've done it. We think they're a brilliant company, so we should be able to do it as well. So I, I, th I think that that sharing and, and telling stories, Jill talked about storytelling, I think is very important. Yeah. I think people, particularly you know SMEs, we get so caught up in the the hecticness of our our day to day yeah. life that we think we don't have time to step out of our own organisations. But I'm a great believer that we have to encourage more of that to happen because otherwise you'll just drown in more and more of the day to day and firefighting. True, true. So on that point, John, this is another John, John Thorley. <laughs> He says he's an academic specializing in organizational change, personal growth, and circular economy. He says he has a lean background from industry. Uh, how can he get involved? John, in, in terms of Interact, I think probably the first thing I would say is, is um, go to our LinkedIn, join our LinkedIn group, and then you'll hear about things that are happening. Or if you're a Twitter person, do the Twitter option. Um, I, 
and I think join us at some of our events. Probably the, the, the LinkedIn and Twitter is how you'll hear about it or directly on our website. Um, there's, there's funding that's available, John, if you're an academic. So there's things that you could apply for. So, for example, we have a call out just now for actionable insights. So if you've been doing research in that kind of um, behaviour change, but doing it in a more academic way, you could apply to get funding to turn that into something that could be usable either by policymakers or manufacturers. Um, the deadline on that one's the 21st of April, I think, but just double check on the website, Actionable Insights Fund, but lots of other opportunities as well. That's just one I can think of just now. Yeah. And a quick comment from me that other institutions, I mean, there's, there's, there's KTN, um, the, the York, we're a member of Make UK, so we, we use them um, in, a, in a mutual, benef mutually beneficial way. But other professional organisations, uh, professional institutions, membership institutions, are very active networks. Um, so they they can provide a lot of leads. Yeah. Thanks, Dana, for putting a link there to the Actionable Insights Fund. Uh, just uh, standing from that question, David, uh, he's interested to know whether there are any activities in Interact that will help them to empower leaders of change, i.e. you have coaching programs, mentoring, or any peer groups. Um, I think, you know, some of our, our uh, events, you know, like the Discovery Days come along and, and see what's happening in other places. And then I think more informally, you can do that link up and, and get mentors. Um, we do have a scheme for early career researchers um, where we've got a mentorship scheme um, that, that's less about industry. Um, but I think we could certainly help put you in touch with lots of places where you can get support from universities, from other providers um, and from organisations like KTN, Innovate UK and so on. So yeah. drop me a line and I'll, I'll, I'll address that more precisely. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think the best way is just to go to the Interact LinkedIn page and just follow it. So Paul, uh, he has a twofold question, I think, for both of you. Uh, so he said that Jill mentioned the four day week working with the manufacturing. However, um, from his standpoint as the, uh, a company worker, they have looked at it from a production efficiency viewpoint, but still struggle to maintain process times and efficiencies without increasing overheads if it's a four-day working week with full-time pay. Have you got an example of how a manufacturing company has actually effectively moved to a four-day working without increasing overheads through the use of technology or any other means? Um, yeah, yes. Um, I mean, Paul, I think first thing I would probably direct you to is, is recently, you might have seen in the media, um, there was a report came out recently. Um, there'd been a study in the UK of 61 companies moving to a four day week. Um, I think that was just end of February, beginning of March. Um, it was run by four day week global and University of Cambridge was involved in that. Some of the IFM um, Institute for Manufacturing people were involved. So I would probably say, go look at that. From my own experience, um, recently, um, I, I mean, uh, one of the companies I work with is, is Talis, uh, based quite close to me, it's just outside Glasgow. Um, they've moved to a four-day week. They're manufacturing. Okay, it's it's not large scale. Um, you know, it's not mass production they're doing there. Um, but they they're enjoying four-day week and also realizing that it's good for the environment because there's less travel for people, less cars on the road, there's less energy being used in the in the factory. Um, so I can certainly share some of that kind of stuff. Um, flexibility works that I mentioned earlier on, they're doing a short um, piece of work at the moment for Scottish government, um, particularly looking not just at the four day week, they're looking at flexibility more generally. They're looking at good examples from manufacturing industry in Scotland. So it's a short uh, study they're doing, they'll be reporting um, in the coming months, um, but Interact are gonna run an event the first week in June um, with them and involving some of these companies. So there's a lot more to come out of that, I think. Can I, yeah. Can I add some quick observations. I haven't got, I'm not going to mention hard examples on all of these, but um, engineering companies have traditionally been four and a half day rather than five day. Um, so there, there, there's maybe something to learn about what, what has been tradition in some sectors. Um, there's some work being done, this I'm referring to work at, done at York, um, where it's not a four-day week in this in the language that we're talking now about reduction in time, but moving 
to, to compressing. And there are a lot of well-being issues in there um, that, that, that if, if done badly, there's presenteeism rather than absenteeism. Um, so the, the, there are productivity issues. But also some companies, and I'll go back to brewing, are very clever with this, um, that brewers use cuckoo brewing um, model where somebody else comes in and uses the facilities at the weekend um, to brew beer. Um, and there's other examples of where manufacturing companies have other tenants on their premises. Mm -hmm. And they're nothing to do with manufacturing. It's, it's, it's just they are using the built environment capital to, to their maximum. So that there's, there's, it's maybe not to be seen just in isolation. Good point. All right. Thank you, uh, Peter and Jill, for your answers. In the interest of time, because we are really close to the end of our session, we will try to answer any remaining questions offline. So in our follow-up email, we will surely include all of the answers from both of our speakers. So if I can just uh, take some of your time, because I want to lead you to one competition that is currently open. Sorry, it's not open yet. It's, it's going to open soon, which is what we call as REFORM. That stands for Resource Efficiency for Materials and Manufacturing. So it's a collaborative research and development competition. So we are looking for projects that can create materials for the future economy, smarter design, making the supply chains more resilient, even though you're not making the products, and as well as making sure that your products are world-class and also can be used longer and also can be recycled easier. You can refer to all of these five core areas from our recently published uh, Materials and Manufacturing Vision 2050 by the Innovate UK. And we have a series of events happening. Uh, one, our briefing event had happened yesterday. So you can scan the first QR code on the top and watch the recording. But please do, if you, if you feel like you're eligible, just want to know more or just want to meet people, uh, please come to our in-person collaboration building event on the 4th of April, the second QR code at uh, Queen Elizabeth II Centre right in central London. But for those who are working in bio-based industries, uh, don't worry, we have another competition for you, which is the last QR code at the bottom. It has opened and it will close uh, in one month plus time. So I thank everyone for your time today. And I hope the session has been very beneficial and we hope to see you in our future events. Bye.